Hi, I'm Marty Demko. I find it really fun to kind of simulate a conversation where you go from thing to thing to thing to thing uh, and not just stay on one topic. Uh, I tried it yesterday and uh, in the 24 hours since then I've gotten some nice comments but I also uh, made a point of keeping track of all the ideas that I thought might be worth sharing and they're in you know incredibly different areas everything from uh, a, an idea for creating an app for preventing procrastination to the joys of self-publishing on Amazon to uh, my thoughts about uh, the best maybe the most potent research that anybody could do some th thoughts about high school football uh, thoughts about diamonds and then uh, key lyrics from classic old love songs uh, and you know wh how real they are so anyway I want to try to cover each of those briefly and hopefully make for just you know interesting listening for those who just want to pass the time or interesting watching anyway um, it strikes me I mean in my among my zillion career counseling clients maybe the most common thread problem is procrastination there's a lot of procrastination going on um, and I was saying to myself okay what would be in my mind the best way to try to quell that and it is an app and I have no you know inclination to try to create an app there's two million apps out there already and I'm not a marketer I'm not going to do any of that but if you have an inclination to create you're looking for some little business to start and it could fail totally but here are my best thoughts on how to create what I call procrastination preventer it would work like this make believe you're procrastinating working on some project a, a you know a honeydew project around the house or a uh, uh, a talk or a paper you got to give to at work uh, or your taxes at that moment when you say oh I think I'm tempted to procrastinate go get a burrito rather than work on the stupid you know report uh, you would simply click open the app and a dozen possible ways what I'm calling procrastination preventers would appear each in one line or two like you know the most obvious one of course is baby steps should you just take a little baby step whether it's the first thing you've got to do or the easiest or the hardest or the most interesting the most motivating there'll be like 12 of those and then you ask yourself okay which of these if any would help you not procrastinate and then you would after you've either procrastinated or finished the task you could note this technique worked for me this one didn't you might rate it it worked great or crappy and it would of course the app would keep track of which ones worked for you and which ones didn't and overall whether you uh, those tasks you attempted to procrastinate whether you got them done and you obviously could just keep it to yourself and look at the graph or whatever or you could share it with somebody or you could um, post it on your social media to get some social pressure to avoid the embarrassment of seeing how badly you procrastinate so um, that's the idea procrastination preventer uh, I have no interest in the money of it or the development of it all I would welcome of course is if any of you think it's a good idea uh, and or adapt it and change it and want to either create it or try to sell it to Apple or uh, a, a time management app that's already existing something to bolt on uh, a Fitbit thing whatever you know an iPhone uh, uh, I or I you know and one of those extras little utilities like voice memos or whatever I'd welcome you letting me know um, either a comment here or emailing me at mnemco that's m-n-e-m-k-o at comcast.net next I am in love with relatively few products but one I really love I guess it's a service is Amazon self-publishing I have had five books published by major publishers including Random House and Wiley and the like and I will simply say that it is an overall more rewarding experience to self-publish I will stipulate the fact that you know unless you have a great platform whether you're published by a major publisher or you're self-publishing the chance of selling many copies is trivial so you write for the process you write because you want to express yourself you want to leave a legacy you want to at least hold out the hope that maybe even after you die there will be you know on the, on the internet there will be your your work the, your oeuvre or your your grand your your great American novel or your memoir or whatever the hell it is uh, why do I love Amazon self-publishing so much first of all it's free and unlike with a major publisher you can keep 70 percent of all royalties all sales as a royalty which is amazing but what I really like best is you can design you it, you only you don't have to be an expert in all it's really quite easy to use 
you just you know create a Microsoft Word file and you know maybe if you you know format it the way you like or if you don't know how to do that hire somebody for a hundred bucks they'll format it into a nice format and then s upload it and then you can design your own cover they have hundreds of cover backgrounds and you can put whatever text you want it's fabulous and the best parts are two things number one you can buy it in quantities of as little as one for the same price as quantities of 500. So a 200 page book is gonna cost you $3. Amazing, if it's in paperback. If it's color illustrations, it's gonna cost you more. That tends to not be worth it. And you can price it pretty much what you want. And the other thing I love is, because I am always having writer's remorse, after I've published, first of all, and you submit the manuscript, and in a day it's published. It's on Amazon, and it's available. You can have it on Kindle. You can have it in print. Amazing. And it's a, you know, at least it's then there on Amazon for people to buy or for you to give away to friends. Um, they even offer free giveaways for five days for promotional purposes. So you can give it away for a few days to your friends and get them to, uh, you know, ask them to write an honest review of it. But what I really love is because of my tendency to have writer's remorse, after I've published it, if I want to make changes, for example, my latest book is Soloist. So it's 123 short, short stories about outsiders or introverts facing a dilemma. Well, it started out my first time I published it, I had only 42 stories, but I kept thinking of more stories and more stories. And anytime I got another 10, I simply added it. And in the next day or two, Amazon has reviewed it and it's the new version is, is published instantly. Now, the current version has got 123 stories and the next version, the probably I like to think it'll be the final, will not only have 124 stories, but I've had my wonderful illustrator, Siddhartha Malik in India, create little cute illustrations, hand drawings of for each of the stories. So, and I will just post that and then everybody who buys it after that will get those, you know, with the illustrations. I love it. Amazon self-publishing, Google it, you'll find it. It's awesome if you have a desire to write. Probably not gonna sell, but if you enjoy the creative act, want to turn it into a book, paperback, hardback, you know, design your own cover or use your own cover for outside. Otherwise, you can illustrate it, have it illustrated or not. It's great, just great. Okay, now I want to talk about something that is really intellectually as stimulating to me as anything. I do believe in the power of intelligence, the power to reason well, abstract, think on your feet. All of that thinking and reasoning and problem solving, whether practical problem solving or curing cancer, um, is an enormously important and today kind of under discussed topic. But we don't know really how to improve intelligence very much. We've tried everything from listening to Mozart to uh, early childhood education, and it, all the unbiased studies find that uh, even one that was commissioned a meta evaluation, or evaluation of all the different programs. Um, by the Obama administration that really wanted to prove that Head Start works, did not find that it made any enduring difference. So we all deeply believed that education was gonna be helpful in closing achievement gap, improving in intelligence and reasoning. And let's just say it has been deeply disappointing to almost all of us. Like, by the way, I'm not saying this to brag, but my PhD is in the evaluation of innovation, evaluation of education, specifically from Berkeley. So it's something I do know something about, and I've been studying this for a zillion years. In any case, I think we need to bet, we all know that all, everything about who we are from our height to our personality, to our predisposition to disease is both environment and genetics. The specific, whether it's 50-50 or 60-40 or it's kind of unnecessarily, uh, the point is certainly in the same way as uh, if you have a Volkswagen and a Porsche in a race, no matter how well you tune up the, uh, um, the Volkswagen, it's not gonna beat the Porsche. You need both the good engine and it tuned up. So both environment and genetics matter. We've been focusing mainly on the environment when we're trying to improve people's performance, whether it's at the low end, very low achievers, multi-generational low achievement, or at the top end. You know, we used to have, you know, the, the, the classes for the gifted and the uh, winners of the Westinghouse Science Fair and send them to the special summer programs or the, uh, uh, you know, elite colleges. There is, you know, it was uh, the president of Harvard, I think his name was Elliot, who said, the reason our Harvard graduates turn out so well is because they come in with so much, not so much that what they get at Harvard is gonna be so enhancing of their intellect, et cetera. You can teach skills, you can teach knowledge, but the brain power, the horsepower, as Lex Friedman calls it, to, to, to reason rigorously and well, 
that has been very, very impervious to improvement by changing the environment. So it strikes me that maybe the most important research that anyone could do is understanding the biological basis of this thing called intelligence. You don't like the word intelligence, call it reasoning, call it problem solving, whatever you like, something in that, in that ability to learn well, not just memorize, but learn and really understand and apply and analyze and synthesize that thing that euphemistically most people call intelligence. So before we can develop something called an intelligence pill, much I'm speaking pill metaphorically, could probably gonna be more like gene editing. We need, we're 20 years away from that, if, that, if ever, because remember, there's a million different genes and uh, expressions of the gene that are operative, you know, from the gene to the, uh, to the protein, to the expression in the protein, to the expression in the cell, expression in, in, uh, in large, uh, the axons and the dendrites and the neurotransmitter soup and the, the, the area before you even get to the, to, the, uh, to the neuron, and then the circuit of all those neurons put together into a circuit, it's really damn complicated. So this is not like something I'm saying, go get a PhD and you know, publish five articles in the next year, because it'll be good for tenure if you publish a lot of articles. No, this is, requires long-term thinking. But I believe, and I really do believe this, that if I were starting over again, I would get a PhD in math or physics because that is the basis on which this is going to be solved. And then I would study, probably using the, the latest uh, electron microscopes, I think they're, they're called transmission electron microscopes, that can, believe it or not, you can observe items down to single hydrogen atoms. So you can see what's really going on, at least, and those are static, but whatever the best video you know, micro video technology to observe how these things occur. And here's my punch. If I were studying it, I would like to take two pools of people or three. One pool of people with 140 IQ, one with say 110 or 100, because that's the, the average worldwide or nationwide at least, and, and those with 70. And I would want to look through that transmission electron microscope at the differences at the atomic level at the cellular level, at the systems level, what are the differences between the 140 IQs way the brain is, is operative, the 110 IQ and, and 70, and that would then generate more specific hypotheses about what would be the easiest or most potent way to try to improve that genetic or biological component of intelligence while fully acknowledging environment matters but we need, we can't fight the battle with both arms tied behind our back. We should be, right now, if we're only looking at environment, we're fighting with one arm. We should be fighting this real battle for improvement of intelligence. And I do believe that the more intelligent, the better. Whether it's at the bottom end, so that people are more able to negotiate life's daily tasks, like finding a place to live, to figuring out how to um, pay the rent, to fix something without having to call the guy, whatever. And at the top end, how to cure COVID or prevent COVID or cancer or depression or be wiser leaders, not like, and, I, and it's not political, not like Donald Trump and not like Joe Biden, but really wise and smart people. Is a part of intelligence altruism? Is it, is it benevolence? Of course, intelligence can be used for evil. We can just look at Hitler. We can look at a million smart people who are nefarious, sociopaths who develop evil pathogens for, for terrorist purposes. But net net, we want to create more and more intelligent people from top to bottom because net, it will do good. Yes, we want to have some government regulation to try to keep, maximize the good. But anyway, that really excites me, as you can tell. I want to let you, you I'm because this is going to be a podcast, I like to take a, a 10 second break so that my announcer can do her thing. Uh, and I'm hoping to stay with you. I'm going to talk afterwards about <laughs> three odd things. I'm going to talk about high school football, musings uh, about that, musings about diamonds, and musings about key lyrics from iconic love songs. Um, and so just please stay with me for a second. I hope I'll be honored if you would. Okay, thank you for staying with me. Um, I'm doing this, I'm trying to make this kind of like 
just interesting to listen to from thing to thing, not long diatribes about anything, but a couple of minutes on whatever. These were just thoughts that, these were ideas that popped them into my brain uh, in the last 24 hours. And what I do is I carry this with me wherever I go. It's a very low-tech thing. It's just a little memo pad, very small, so it fits in your pocket. And you can't close it without putting your pen back in. I love it. It's called a flip note. And so any time, you know, I was hiking with the dog, any time I was free and out with a client or writing, I was thinking about what's interesting, and I would jot it down. And this is, these were the thoughts I had in the last 24 hours. And um, I hope you'll find it, you're finding it interesting. Okay, high school football. The conventional modern wisdom is, oh, why would you want to risk concussions, traumatic brain injuries? You know, why, you know, it's so violent. It teaches aggression. It's, uh, it's, you know, why are we teaching young people in the formative parts of their life violence? And, uh, you know, it's the most aggressive and violent of games. I can see that argument, but I do, I like the, I'm a constitutional moderate, meaning, I don't mean constitution as in U.S. Constitution. I mean, my, my, my tendency is to see wisdom from right and left from multiple perspectives. So it's, you know, it's widely denigrated, the idea of, you know, tackle football, especially at this high school level no matter how much we make the helmet safe and the rest of it. Here's why I think we need to balance that worry against the positive. From where I sit, the vast, vast majority of people who play high school football don't get traumatic brain injuries. They may get minor injuries or injuries that, that are not life career anywhere, they're gonna live forever, but minor injuries. But the benefits, nearly everybody you speak to who has played you know, whether even be middle school or high school, football or basketball, love it. Love it. And love matters. Joy matters. And they also tend to grow. Yeah, that's the cliche, but the teamwork, the learning how to win gracefully, learning how to lose gracefully, the skill development, the break from the nonstop academics of high school, which are always, not always, most students find boring as hell learning geometry, learning English literature, learning a foreign language, learning the history of the War of the Roses, learning, uh, learning you know, even uh, economics. And here you get a break from that, a, a breather, and can be largely physical and fun competitive. And again, there's great opportunities to learn ethics. The great coaches do not teach cutting corners. The great coaches teach work ethic, hard work, trying hard to win, but gracefully accepting losing. What great lessons. I think those trump net-net in terms of benefit to humankind, the benefits of high school and college football, trump the risks associated with playing football. Those are my musings about football. A little bit about diamonds. This is beyond me to understand. You can get a beautiful two, three, five carat cubic zirconium, perfectly cut, no flaws, with almost as much fire as the typical diamond that people buy for about five bucks, 10 bucks, depending on how greedy the, 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 the vendor is. But maybe 50 bucks would be a lot. A diamond. Let's just take a two and a half carat diamond of that quality, that degree of shine, that level of perfection, that whiteness rather than you know, yellowed or whatever, would probably cost about, I'm guessing here, but roughly twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars twenty thousand dollars $20,000 versus $10. And yet people venerate diamonds, are willing to put themselves in a financial hole for maybe even not be able to afford the down payment on a house. To get a diamond rather than a cubic zirconium? This is something I don't ever, I, I don't begin to understand. Okay, last thing I want to talk about are some lyrics. Um, I'm going to be giving a talk at the Mensa convention, and it's called uh, Music of Love and Life. And so I, and I'm going to be, so I'm going to be playing these different love songs through the ages. And I identified, I looked at the lyrics for each, and I picked the phrase in each that I thought was most interesting. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share that phrase, uh, ask my 
the audience to think about what, if anything, it means to them, whether they agree with it, disagree with it, whatever. And then I'm going to play the thing. And I'll do one for you. I'm going to play Sunrise, Sunset for you in the, at, at, just to end this thing. But I've got it one, two, three, four, five, six. Six songs uh, that I want to talk about very briefly each. The, early, the oldest is Let Me Call You Sweetheart. I think it was from the 1910s or something. And the, the uh, phrase I like the best is keep the love light glowing. It's very easy to fall in love the infatuation, whether it's caused simply by the novelty or the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, uh, God knows what else, the magic uh, that creates infatuation and love, makes it easy to fall in love, especially if you're lonely. But to keep it going, how many people who end up getting married use the term, we, I got hitched, like you are a beast of burden, an ox onto a plow. How to keep love light glowing? I'm not sure I know. I've been with my wife 49 years. I love my wife. I really do. I can't see being with anybody else. I really can't, as crazy as that sounds. But are the love lights glowing? No. We enjoy being with each other. We've learned what we can discuss or argue about what we can't. But keep the love light glowing, I don't know. By the way, people who are lonely, often many people, I'm just going on a sidetrack here, really wish they had a mentor. How many people go through life wishing they had a mentor and they don't have one? Including me. You know, uh, I had always kind of quietly, maybe even unconsciously hoped that some professor would take me under wing, some person who was smarter and wiser or more knowledgeable than I would say, come here, son, you have potential. Here's what I think you should do. And not sure that I would do exactly what they said, but here I am, 72 years old. It hasn't happened. Imagine that's true of some of you. And I've reached out to a bunch of people, and it hasn't seemed to work. Maybe I'm just too intense or I'm too something. But my best shot for you, if you're lonely for a mentor, for some wise person, is to try to reach out, not say, be my mentor, that's too much, but ask for a little advice about something specific so it makes it an easy thing for them to do. And then if they do it, thank them, offer to do something in exchange, and little by little, like any relationship, let it build slowly, and if you're lucky, you'll have one, maybe more mentors. Okay, back to the, back to these lyrics. Uh, in the sequence of uh, uh, after "Let Me Call You Sweetheart," um, the next one was "My Funny Valentine," um, a lovely song, and my favorite little phrase from that is "Don't change a hair for me." I like the wisdom of that because it's so hard to change people fundamentally. You can change little things, and I've even changed. I used to be much more of a pig. My wife would really be annoyed at me uh, that I wouldn't be, I wouldn't clean up my clothes or whatever. Uh, I also used to be uh, very quiet. I wouldn't say cheapskate, that's a little too strong. But I've always was very cautious for money. But I've changed both of those. I'm neater now and I'm not as tight with money. Um, but how much can we change people? Do we try to just change them around the edges? Or do we try to, you know, as how many people have gotten into a romantic relationship because the sex was good or they liked them otherwise? Uh, and but they say they 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 think they have this terrible flaw. But I'll change him or her. I think don't change a hair for me. Is less a statement of that they really want the person exactly as it is as to how difficult it is to change. My funny Valentine. Next in the this, this next song that I'm going to uh, play at the RG is Over the Rainbow, and the uh, the line I like the best from that is Birds fly over the rainbow. Why then, oh why, can't I? I like the oh why. It really emphasizes the frustration, how difficult it is. Birds fly over the rainbow. Why then, oh why, can't I? What's the metaphor? Birds fly over the rainbow. Think big. Dream big. And I understand Goethe said that. He said something like, dream big because no man is motivated by small goals. I, I, I've just bastardized that, boulderized that, or whatever. It's not accurate, but it's that point. And it's really easy. The media, and I really think of Oprah as the quintessential example of this, teaches everybody to be, th dream big. Every celebrity says, dream big, you can do it. And yet for every person who dreamt really big, there is a probability that he won't achieve even partway there. And his, head, his or her head is shaking. Why the hell did I take that crazy risk? 
So I think the more nuanced, more appropriate way to, to address this is how big should I, a risk should I take given my per place in life, how able I am, what my track record is, how exciting that other opportunity is, what's my opportunity cost, what else did I do? So this, you know, birds fly over the rainbow, they get really high to the ultimate, why can't I? I don't believe in, in one size fits all dream big. I believe in, I, in making an individualized decision based on who you are, what your risk is of failure, and uh, how excited you are about this goal versus something else. Okay, the next song uh, that I'm going to play and uh, share a lyric is, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, is Yesterday, the, uh, the Beatles uh, song. Uh, yesterday, in this phrase I liked, yesterday all my troubles seemed so far away. Right, when you're young, the troubles that are going to be the big ones, you know, dying, slowing down, loss of your parents, loss of a loved one, feel very far away. Those are the big ones, I guess. Uh, and I think then the father in is something, that's why I believe in yesterday, so he doesn't have to think about uh, all that crap. Uh, he, it's a way, no, it's about longing for the time when he didn't have to think about all that crap. And now he's older, 50, 60, 70, whatever. And now those troubles right in his face. They weren't far away. My troubles seem so far away. No, now you're 50, 60, 70. Uh, and they're right in your face. I like that. Uh, then uh, I think a couple of years later, a song was a country western song. It was, uh, I think it's Kenny Rogers uh, saying, help me make it through the night. It was it Glenn Campbell, I think? It, uh, I don't remember, one of those two. Um, anyway, uh, so the, the phrase I liked very best from that was, yesterday is dead and gone, and tomorrow's out of sight. Makes exactly the same point. No, it's a, it, it, it makes, the second part makes the same point as, don't, uh, as um, uh, yesterday, uh, all my trouble seems so far away, as tomorrow is out of sight. That's the same point. But the first part of that quote, yesterday is dead and gone. That's like almost, a, it's ironic that a country western singer would be, it's almost Buddhist-like, be in the moment. Um, Yesterday is dead and gone. Don't don't look back. And my, certainly, my father, who rarely talked about the Holocaust, and most of the people who were Holocaust survivors who did well, did not look back. He, they did believe in Kenny Rogers' statement, "Yesterday is dead and gone," and really tried to take next next step forward. So I really like that quote. Uh, yesterday is dead and gone, and tomorrow's out of sight. And finally, the final uh, uh, song uh, that I'll play for them, and uh, I want to briefly talk about what line for you is "Sunrise Sunset." And uh, the, my favorite line in that is, swiftly fly the years. It's a cliche, but it's true. I really feel like it was only yesterday that my wife and I had our daughter, Amy, and she was two years old, and she would say, you know, uppy do. She wants to be lifted up, or, you know, she would be between us, and I would hold my daughter's hand one hand, and my, and my wife on the other side hold her other. And we were walking in a snowsuit in New York at age t two or three. And now she's 51. Uh, 71. Yeah, 51. And uh, she's a big, big attorney for the Justice Department. Um, it goes so fast. And that partly, that's what drives me to keep working so hard. I'm 72 and I love to be productive. And this, to doing something like this, as well as my clients and my writings, are, I believe, the best use of my time while I'm still, you know, in good shape. Uh, so, I, as I promised you, I was going to play one thing. I'm going to play one chorus of Sunrise, Sunset, uh, just to capstone this little thing. So I'm going to turn the... Uh, uh, yeah, okay, that'll work. I think this is beautiful. I can't sing, so I can't, but uh, I'll play a little bit because I can't play.
Okay, there you go. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so my efforts can have broader impact. I also like answering questions, so I plan to do more of these. If you have a question you'd like me to riff on, or uh, address a formal term, I welcome that. I also welcome you looking at my two new books, uh, Jeremy's Quests, Succeeding and Starting Out, or Soloists, 123 short, short stories about introverts and outsiders facing a dilemma. And in any event, I do thank you for watching. I am Marty Nemco.